thankful to be able to be you able to fill in. Uh, if you didn't hear, uh, Brother Perry and Sister Susie, they've been out of town, and um, they are they Sister Susie's cousin. Uh, I know I said it already, but just in case somebody was walking in or wondering online where the pastor is, he they had the funeral to attend for Sister Susie's cousin, and um, they are out of town. We will be meeting up with them tomorrow. Uh, we will be going to our staff retreat uh, this week and excited about that. And we will be meeting up with them. Uh, but once again, he's asked me to fill in this pulpit. And uh, it's always a privilege. It's always an honor to be able to do anything uh, for the Lord. And um, this is a, a message that I've been praying about, uh, kind of been, been in my heart for a long time, some several months. And uh, that can be a dangerous thing, uh, especially whenever there's a, a limited time and you got to kind of condense and figure out what to, what to share, what to leave out, and what to leave here. If, if you're a preacher, you, you can understand. Uh, sometimes we may not have the luxury to have a part two or three or four, or whatever the case is. So we got to figure out what to put in there in, in a limited amount of time. Um, it's our responsibility to get that message across, and that's what I hope to do. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to look at the book of Revelation Chapter 7, verse 9 through 12, just, to, just real quick, this is what we just sang about. We sang about holy is the Lord. We sang about uh, different things you, that you hear about worshiping his name, his holiness, the elders, the angels, what's going to be taking place, what is taking place even now uh, with our loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord in heaven. And so it says, after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. A great multitude which no man could number. It was so much that he couldn't even begin to estimate to say, you know, well, maybe a couple of million, a few million, whatever. He couldn't even estimate the amount of people that he saw of all nations, of all kindreds, and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. The main thing was at the beginning of verse 9, where John said he saw a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, of all kindreds, of all people, and of all different tongues. And then the way my mind thinks, my mind thinks I thought, you know, if God revealed to John the future, what's to be, what's to come, if he, if he gave him a little glimpse of the ages of what's going to happen, you know, at the end of time, who can say if John maybe saw one of our faces in that crowd? Who can say if John saw one of our loved ones' faces that have been down with the Lord in that crowd? He doesn't know who we are. He doesn't know what we look like. But as he's scanning the crowd, who can say that maybe he saw one of us or our family sitting around the throne together? That's a great, that's a, that's just, that just kind of blew me away. Who can say if he, if he saw us there? Do you have a made-up mind to go? Do you have a made-up mind? Have you sold out to Christ 100% to make sure that no matter what, you'll pay the cost to make sure you make it to heaven? If we have a made-up mind, he might have scanned us through that crowd. So this is, Revelation is where the Bible ends it, and it shows the ending when the Lord comes and he rules and reigns. Satan is defeated once and for all. This is after the millennial reign, after all that kind of stuff. We won't get into all that uh, this morning. But that's where it ends. I never understood why people that like to read books, not everybody, but some people that like to read books, they read the, the ending first before they read the beginning. They want to know how it ends. They want to know how, what's going to happen before they even pick it up, you know. And so that's for those people. Right here we know how it's going to end, the Bible. We know God's going to win. We know his people, the church, is going to get raptured out of here. We know what's going to happen to the devil. We know that we are victorious in Christ. So we know the end. But I want to take us back to where it begins, to the start. And why I'm going to tie up revelations and the multitude, hopefully, by the grace of the Lord, tie all this up together. Like I said, it's just a lot to try and tie up. But... Uh, this is laying the groundwork for the message this morning is titled, Made in His Image. Made 
in his image. And we're going to look at what the reason we were made for his image was and the significance of why we were made in his image. There's a reason why we were made in his image. There's a reason why it says that he made man and woman after his image as a beautiful creature. We will look at that. We're created with a purpose. You are created. You are created. You were created. You're here today with a purpose, for a purpose. And there's difference. I understand. There's different shades of white. There's different shades of brown. There's different shades of eye color. There's different shades of hair color, whatever your natural one is. It's not dyed or whatever the case is. But there's different bodies. There's different the way the way the Lord made us to be different. To look different, may look similar, may have similar features, but they're still different. You look at my nephew, he's about as white as this right here, blue eyes, but he looks just like my brother. Normally, the, the, the darker gene is the most dominant gene, but it didn't work in this case. He come out with green eyes or blue, blue green eyes and blonde hair, but he looks just like my brother. I told my mom, I said, you don't want to be caught with him at Dollar General or something. They're going to think you stole him. They're not going to believe he's your grandkid. <laughs> Brother Austin is the whitest Creek Indian I've ever seen. He says he's Creek Indian. That's what he says. But your color, your race, your gender, all is God-given. All is God-given at birth and is special for a reason. Again, God created me and you in his image. We go back to Genesis 1-1. It starts with, in the beginning, God. There's some people that can't get over that. In the beginning, God. If we're going to believe this Bible, we have to get past this. In the beginning, God. That's what it takes. You want to believe the Bible? You have to believe that in the beginning, God was there. Created heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. That's the way the Bible starts. And then in between a few, a, few, a few verses, he says that the Bible says that he moved upon the face of the waters. The earth was void without form. It says that God said, let there be light. Then there was light. Then the stars and different things. It says that the, the God separated day and night. And then it says that he made the firmament, separated the sky. He separated the waters from dry land. And after that, after he separated the waters and he made the seas and the oceans and then now there's dry land, there's mountains, there's different things. The Bible says that then after that he made the grass, he made the, the trees and the herbs and everything that was green. And we find that in Genesis 1.11 it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Have you picked up something in there that a lot of that said after his kind? The beginning of Genesis 1:11 all the way to Genesis 7 and 14, between those chapters we find the words, we find these specific words after their kind or after his kind. 17 times in between those verses. Between chapter 1 and chapter 7, you find that, that terminology 17 times. Talking about reproducing after its kind, after their kind. Reproducing, replicating, duplicating, producing a copy of, repeating the cycle, etc. That's what it's talking about. The birds and the trees, different things after their kind. This lets us know as we read the Bible that life must not always remain in, in, in the term of, of, of a little bitty seed. The seed must not always remain. Life must not just remain germinal, what, what, what you would call the seed. In other words, the seed must not always just remain a seed. The seed has to grow. The seed will do you no good if it's sitting on this desk up here. You got to plant it in soil. You got to water it. You got to bring it out to the sun. The seed will do no good in that carpet. It'll do no good in my hand. It'll no do good do no good in my pocket. It wasn't meant just to sit there. It was meant to germinate. It was meant to reproduce after itself. It was meant to be put down and growth on the ground. That's what it's talking about. It must expand. It must develop. The world is full of people who have great thoughts and great skills and great testimonies and great things that they that they know in the Lord, but get Guess what? They never reproduce. They never plant the seeds. They keep it all to themselves. 
I'm not only talking about reproducing in the physical sense of having children. I'm aware that some here or some somewhere may be listening and may not be able to have children for whatever the case is, if that's the Lord has it. So it's not just limited. I'm talking about to reproducing physically. I'm talking about something deeper. I'm talking about spiritual. Passing on what you know, reproducing that life of Christ. We heard that in that testimony. Brother Austin's grandma, what was she doing? She was reproducing that life of Christ in her life. And now they have a man that was a prisoner. Uh, he was in jail. And guess what? That life is going on. And now if he produces that life in somebody else, you see how he continues to grow and produce and multiply as God intended it to be. So, again, not just a physical reproduction. I'm talking about spiritual. People never pass it on. They've seen great things, experienced great things, but guess what? That's where it dies with them. Never sit down with anybody. Never sit down and tell somebody how they overcame or how God did something in their life. They just keep it to themselves. They go to the grave with that knowledge. They go to the grave with that testimony and never pass it on. The life of Christ is meant to be reproduced. It's meant to be passed on. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. When you look into that word teach, when you look deeper into that word, it's basically not just saying just teach them something, but it's saying make disciples. Make disciples. When you look deeper into the word, in other words, it says go make disciples of the nations. Go make disciples of the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach these disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Be sure. Be sure that I'm with you even until the end of the age. He's saying make disciples. Teach these disciples all my commands. Teach the disciples what the Bible says. More than just a convert, he didn't say go and make converts. He said go and make disciples. There's difference between converts and disciples. God has called us to make disciples. A convert can be converted to anything at any time. We can teach a monkey how to raise his hands at any time. You can give them a treat. You can teach a dog to do a trick at any time. You can teach a parrot to repeat a word at any time. Sadly, you do this, people do the same thing with people. Just repeat a couple words after me. There's no real repentance. There's no nothing. Just repeat these words. You go on about your business. Oh, you're saved. Then people are wondering what's going on. God said, Jesus said, go make disciples. We reproduce after our own kind. A convert will produce another convert. A disciple will produce a disciple. That's why it was important for us. It's important for us to be discipled and to make disciples because we will reproduce after our own kind. If I can't share or pass on the knowledge, then it'll die with me. We talked about that just a minute ago. Fruit after his kind. The growth will always be the same kind as the seed. Because every seed will produce fruit after its kind. Later on, we see that the Lord made the whales and the birds and the animals. Uh, Genesis 122, I believe it talks about that. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful, multiply the waters and the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. It talks about after their kind. But now we see a new word. We see a word that says multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. We begin to see that in verse 22 for the first time. And we see that same word all the way to chapter 48. He begins to talk about multiply, increase, grow exponentially, become more numerous, reproduce, and I will multiply you. And I will do this, multiply, multiply. He's saying what? Reproduce the life. Don't just keep it to yourself. Don't just sit down on the couch or, or whatever. Go multiply this life that I've put inside you to other people, those around you. You can only reproduce, again, what you are. If you're deep-rooted, that's what you'll reproduce. If you're shallow, that's what you will reproduce. 
If you're deep rooted in Christ and know the deep things of Christ, then you can teach the deep things of Christ. But if all you know is basic, shallow things, that's all you will be able to teach. That's all you'll be able to share. Today, salesmanship Christianity only wants to present the things that are desirable qualities of Christianity. Today, salesmanship Christianity just want to present the benefits and the good stuff, like trying to sell Geritol or something like that. Hey, here's the vitamins. This is what it's going to do for you. It's going to produce, you know, hair growth right here. It's going to produce strong muscles. It's going to produce no fatigue. It's going to do this and that. And that's the way they want to present Christianity. You accept Jesus, you know, he's going to bless you all the time. You're going to have unlimited amount of money, unlimited amount of this. You'll never get sick. Death will never touch your house. You accept Jesus, everything will be all right he'll take care of everything you won't ever have to pray you won't ever have to fast you will never have to go to church all you got to do is say babble a little bit a few words and that's it you're inbound for heaven they're trying to sell it the benefits and ignore the rest trying to tell you it's going to be sunny skies all day and then when a person grows up that way when a person becomes a Christian that way that it's going to be sunny skies all day the first sign of clouds or a storm they end up folding like a lawn chair because they wonder where did this cloud come from where did these storms come from man the first bitter cold of winter the first bitter chill cutting through your through your body and stuff man well I thought it was going to be warm and sunny I thought everything was going to be fine Man, they, they never told me this. Something must not be right. Something must be wrong. And then you never see them come through those church doors again. They were told wrong. But when somebody is told the truth, when somebody is told this is the way it's going to be, this is how it is, this life will cost you everything. You will have to turn away from some things. You will have to say no to some things. You will have to lay down your life. You will have to change. You will have to be different. There will be ups and downs. There will be storms. But guess what? They'll come and go. There are going to be things. There is going to be sickness that may come to your house. Maybe even death may come to your house. There will be people that may get cancer. There will be people that may die from it. There will be things that may come and touch our homes. But guess what? If you're going through those times, you won't be alone because you'll have a God that will walk with you and talk with you. You'll have a church family that will stick with you and believe with you and pray for you. As you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll have something to fall back on as you walk the storms of life hallelujah a God that said he'll never leave us nor forsake us they will be conditioned conditioned to endure that's why the military and trains all their soldiers and stuff because they got to be conditioned to endure what they're going to face run Several miles with a backpack full of stuff or leave them out in the, in the middle of nowhere with just a, no food or barely any food so they can learn how to be conditioned. Let them know, hey, this is war. It ain't going to be all fun and games. You can have drones and robots and this and that, but there comes a time where all that may be gone and you got to go out there face to face and see another person in unknown territory, and you got to know how to survive the elements. you got to know how to, how to make things happen, you know, how to make shelter and different things. So they're being conditioned to endure, conditioned to endure whatever may happen. There's a certain place in Ireland where trees are big and they're beautiful. A brother from Ireland that lives there was telling me about it, but they have shallow roots. And the reason they have shallow roots is because there's not a lot of wind there. There's not a lot of wind that comes and blows in there. They have rain, but the rain is it's not like rain we get here. It's a nice little sprinkle or a mist. And so because there's no crazy wind, no crazy storms, there's no need for those trees to grow deep roots. But every now and then, there comes an abnormal storm every now and then. There comes something that, that's not the normal. And when it comes and it blows, guess what? Most of those trees end up falling down and getting uprooted. Why? Because they're not conditioned to it. It's not a natural thing that happens. They're not conditioned to it. And I know I told this before, but I'll tell it again, talking about trees. When I was a kid, I was, as many of you know, I was born in Southern California. And a lot of those places, not just the beach, but they have uh, big, tall palm trees. 
that are out through the city, the city of angels they call it. There's no angels there, but that's what they call it. And so you see the palm trees and tall, and one day I'm, I'm, my dad's driving, and like I said, I'm just a kid, and my mom's in the back seat or something, however it was, she, she pointed at those trees, at the palm trees, and she said, you see those big tall trees? She said, that's how I want to be, serving the Lord. I just thought, that's nice. Okay. <laughs> that's cool. I didn't understand it all the way at the time. Again, I was a kid. I was a child. I didn't understand what she was meaning. But later in life, as I had my own relationship with God, later in life, as I began to face my own storms, later in life, as trouble began to touch my house, as trouble began to touch my job and different things that I was dealing with, later on, I understood what she meant. There's pictures. There's videos of palm trees that are all along the coast of the beach. And you see that wind blowing and it's almost like the leaves look like hair just pushing all the way back. And the palm trees almost touching the ground. It's, it's blowing so hard that the palm trees like just, it looks like it's just hanging on as that wind is just battering it and blowing. And it's just sitting there just strong. And it's just hitting. And so it, it began to let me know those palm trees that are in the coast are conditioned to endure those high winds. They're conditioned to resist. When the wind comes, it's going to do this. And then one day, when I was watching a video of Katrina, we were in Louisiana. I was watching what it did to the coast. They showed that wind. Again, I saw the palm trees. All of a sudden, it hit me what my mom said. She said, I want to be like that palm tree is in God. When the storms of life comes, I might bend, but I'm not going to break. I'm going to be hold on to Christ that I know. I might bend all the way. I might be touching the floor, but as soon as that wind dies down I'm going to pop right back up I want to be rooted and grounded in the Lord I want to be rooted and grounded in Christ to know him and to make him known should be our goal that's the kind of Christianity I want to pass on that's the kind of Christianity I want to reproduce people that are strong that can endure the trials of life, because life is just, it's going to throw a curveball at us. And we'll see why it happens that way. It's got to be that way. We, it'd be nice if it wasn't, but it has to be that way. Once again, according to its kind, all animal life was created according to its kind. God deliberately made plenty of variation within that kind, but one kind cannot become another kind. There is an instinct already inside an animal that lets them know that they need to reproduce with the same animal of their kind. There is an instinct already inside the animal that tells it when to migrate, when to do things, the seasons of time, when to go to Canada if they have to, when to fly down south for the winter. There's already something inside them, an instinct inside the animal that lets them know what to do. There's an instinct inside a newborn again believer. You remember when God touched you for the first time and you were saved and you knew you were saved and you knew that God changed your life. As a born again believer, there's that instinct that says this new life, I want to share it with somebody. I want to tell somebody about Christ. Let me tell you about what God did. Let me tell you about how he touched my life. I was in a prison cell or I was in my bedroom or I was at the job or I was in a forklift. I was at the Walmart store. I was at the gas station wherever it was I was in the field and God touched me let me tell you about what he did it's an instinct that a believer has to want to reproduce that life to want to share that life the life of Christ to pass it on to somebody that may not know to pass it on and to let this lost and dying world know hey look there's a God out there I told uh, my boys I may have told him, I don't know if I did, I told my wife, you know, back in our younger days, we didn't have text message and all that to talk to, to, to girls and stuff, and we would email. That's what I would do. I would email back and forth. And I had about three different girls I was emailing. This was before marriage. <laughs> and we would just email back and forth, you know. It wasn't text message. Sometimes you had AOL or something called ICQ, different little messenger things. But we would email. And we would just talk about different things. But when God changed my life, 
I messaged all four of those girls what God did in my life. Three didn't respond, and one said, that's cool. (laughs) You think I lost sleep over it? Not one bit. God did something in my life, and it was too good for me not to share. You take it or leave it. You want to still be my friend? That's good. You want to go and do your separate thing? Go ahead and do your separate thing. But God did something in my life. I was over here sharing how God called me to the ministry, and I want to do this and that. Something Talking a totally different language, totally different person than what Paul used to be. And that's why some of them didn't know what to say, and the other person said it was cool. But it didn't affect me because that life of Christ was inside me. And I said, God, I want to spread this gospel. I want to spread the good news wherever I go. It doesn't matter who it is. I want to let them know that you're real and that you can work in somebody's life. That's what the life of Christ does. That's what God wants us to do when he says be fruitful and multiply he wants this life that he's put inside of us to be multiplied and shared with other people you will reproduce after your kind there are hundreds I asked brother Austin yesterday because he's he's besides him brother Earl he's the only one that I know that has uh, well, I guess the hardest two chickens. But I asked them how many breeds of chickens there are. There's hundreds. I mean, we can't even. I thought it was just a couple. You know, I thought he was about to name a couple. But no, it's, it's too many for him to name. It's hundreds. It's in the hundreds. Now, he did tell me he's got seven different kinds. And he likes them because of the seven different kinds, uh, they make different eggs, different color eggs, chocolate. I don't know. He was going into all this stuff, you know. I just eat it. You know, I don't really care. As long as it tastes good, scrambled, whatever it is, omelet, I'll eat it. But he was just telling me about the color, and this one makes a big one, and this one does this, and this one does that. And, you know, at one time I think he said he had like 17 different ones. Although there is hundreds of different kinds of chickens, that egg that they lay it's not all of a sudden going to hatch a parrot. It's not all of a sudden going to hatch an eagle. It's not all of a sudden going to hatch a lizard or a snake or an insect. It's going to hatch a chicken after its kind. You can try and breed it with a lizard. You can try and breed it with a pig. It's not going to work. You can breed different types of dogs. We got a special mutt dog. It's a little bitty thing, and it's a mixture of different multi-pool, whatever it is called. I don't know. I, like I said, I don't know all that stuff. I just know there's Labrador Retrievers. I know that one. Husky, because that's what we got. We have a husky dog. Um, I, I mean, there's different types of dogs. People breed them, and they make them Great Danes, Dalmatians. There's all kind of stuff. Golden Retrievers, and then they mix, you know, this breed, this German Shepherd maybe mix with this other dog and make a little one and this and that. But even though they're being bred with other dogs, they're still a dog. They're still a dog. You're breeding it with another dog, but at the end of the day, whether it's a German Shepherd mixed with a Husky or whatever the case is, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but it's still a dog. No matter how much you try and breed it with another animal, it's not going to work. That's a monstrosity. That's an abomination. That's not what God intended it to be. Because he said the plants and the animals, everything will produce after its own kind. Amen. You can breed them. You can breed them. But that's what they're going to be. You're not a human that's really a dog or an animal trapped in a human's body. That's not how it works. To all those fairies, furries, whatever they call them, all those crazy people crawling around like cats and dogs and howling, talking about this is what I really am. That's a lie. The Bible says you produce after your own kind. You are a human being. You are a person, not an animal reincarnated. I used to be a lizard or a snake. You may act like a snake. You may be a snake in the way you act, but you weren't a snake, physical For the evolutionists, a germ or a bacteria is going to reproduce 
another germ or a bacteria. It didn't just all of a sudden reproduce a human out of nowhere. You got no bones and all of a sudden you just produce bones? A monkey did not all of a sudden produce a human. A monkey is going to produce another monkey. You may act like a monkey, you may look like a monkey, but you're still a human. A monkey didn't all of a sudden produce a human being after millions and thousands and hundreds of years and whatever the case is. And, you know, I got a picture of a moth, and this is, this is, this is something that they try to use a lot when they talk about evolution, especially microevolution. That's called the peppered moth. Some people call it the Darwin's moth. The Darwin, the guy that talks about the theory of evolution and different things. But you see it's two different colors. You got a light one and you have a dark one. And the reason they like to use this one when they talk about evolution and different things, how it's happening before our eyes and microevolution, whatever the case is, is because the dark one came to be. Evidently, there was only white ones like that. But the dark one came to be because of a genetic mutation that began to happen because during the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of smoke and a lot of, you know, all the coal plants and all the stuff that was, that was coming out. The birds were able to see the white ones and eat the white ones, and so they wouldn't go extinct. All of a sudden, somehow through mutation, they began to get dark to camouflage from the birds, to be better camouflaged for survival. And then when the pollution levels began to decrease, you would begin to see more of the white ones than you did the dark ones. And so they looked at that, and, and they said, well, here it is. That proves it. That proves that evolution is still happening before our very eyes. But guess what? Even though that's a white and a dark moth, it's still a what? A moth. It's not a bird. It's not a fish. It's not a human. It just didn't develop limbs or something crazy out of, uh, because it just wanted to. It's still a moth. It's still what it is. It's still after its kind, even though it may look different. That doesn't prove anything to me about evolution. Where's the bones? Where's the stuff that shows a gradual increase from a moth becoming gradually a bird? Where are the fossils that show that or that it just happened overnight? A chicken laid an egg and all of a sudden, boom, it was a human being. Where's the structure? Where's the evidence in the fossils that shows Slowly how the limbs began to change. And slowly throughout years and years and years, there's nothing like that that they can show. Anyway, the point is, it's after its kind. That's what the Lord said. These things will produce according to their kind. The phrase is emphasized that it's after their kind. I can put on a Fake nose on my husky dog, a pig nose, but it's still a dog. I can take a pigtail and sew it on the dog, take his tail out and put a pigtail in there, a little curly tail. I'll be put in jail for animal cruelty and stuff, but it's still a dog. They'll throw me in jail. They'll say, that's not normal. You can't put a, 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 a pig tail on a dog. You can't put a pig nose on a dog. That's cruel. But you'll let a 14-year-old girl take her breasts off? Huh? You'll let a 14-year-old put breasts on and that's fine? That's not cruel? You'll let a 13-year-old, 14-year-old make their own decisions and say, you know what, I want to be this and that and that's fine. That's no big deal. That's normal. It makes no sense. That's what the Bible says, produce after their kind. Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. God created he, him, male and female created he, them. Male and female created he, them. To God, the differences between men and women are clear. They're clear. He created us. It's clear that men are not women and women are not men. The, per, the, the perversion of our day that we're living in is they're trying to cause this gender confusion. 
to say, well, you might be this or you might be this or that or whatever. They're trying to act like there's no difference between a man and a woman. There is a difference. Are men better than women? In some areas, yes. Are women better than men? In some areas, yes. If you're married and you have children, I'm married, I have kids, I'm superior at being a dad than she would be. And she's superior at being a mom than I would be. A man's going to do what a man does, and whatever a woman does, that's what they're going to do. We can't do each other's job. It's not going to work. It's second class. It wasn't intended to be that way. All right, so what does all this have to do with the first verse you read? We're about to get there. In Revelation, what does this have to do with the end? We've talked about reproducing after your kind. We talked about passing the life of Christ. In short, like I've been saying, we've been made in God's image to spread his image. We were created in God's image to spread his image. We were created in God's image to portray his image. To portray his image on this earth. As ambassadors of God, as humans that he's made us, to portray his image to this earth, to everybody we come in contact with. In Genesis 128, it says, God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. You skip down to Genesis 2.8. It says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. How many of you heard of the Garden of Eden? It says that the Lord planted a garden in Eden. So he put them on the earth, replenished the earth, subdued it, but then he plants a garden. All right, this lets me know. That the whole earth was not Eden. The whole earth wasn't just Eden. God planted Eden. A little garden that he put together. And there he put man who he formed in verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So he gave Adam some instructions. This is my garden. And I want you to dress it. I want you to keep it. I want you to take care of the trees and everything that's going on in here. It's my garden, it's my stuff, but I'm, I'm going to leave you in charge to take care of everything that's going to happen here, along with your other commands. Keep it. Then he told him, I didn't have that verse in there, but if you keep reading, that's when the Lord says, of every tree you can eat, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can have every tree, every fruit, everything you want, except this tree. This tree is for me. There's a little, there's the free will right there. You There's going to be consequences. If you eat this tree, the Lord says you're going to die. And the devil heard that. We don't have time to get into all that. I'm going to try and keep it where I'm I'm trying to go. So, again, put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it, to keep it. Adam was in the most, it was paradise. I mean, that's what it was. It was paradise. God made it. It was beautiful. Sin wasn't in there yet. I mean, we can't even imagine the type of trees, the kind of fruit. If, if it looked amazing after the fall of man, when they were trying to possess the land flowing with milk and honey, just imagine what it was in the Garden of Eden, how beautiful it was, and the trees and, and, the, and the pure crystal water, the rivers that the Bible talks about, how they flowed and everything like that. And so he, was, he told Adam, tend it and keep it. And me and Brother Mike were talking about a, a man who was a great example, who would work. He was an older gentleman, but he would work. He loved to work, and he worked for a reason. He had a purpose. Even though he could have retired, even though he could have just been taking the easy life, he chose to work. Why? Because because that's, that's who he was, but God also has it for us to work. He doesn't just want us to sit around and do nothing. Work was something that God said was good for man. He said, Adam, hey, I got all this for you, but I still want you, I still got a couple of jobs I need you to do. Even though it didn't have thorns and even though it wasn't like it is now, sweating and stuff, there were still certain things that God told Adam, 
I want you to take care of these things. Here's a couple of tasks. Here's a couple of duties. He just didn't say, hey, just, you know, make you some lemonade and sit down in that shade and just sit down and do nothing. He said, yeah, you can enjoy everything, but there's a couple of things I need you to do. Because God doesn't like idleness or laziness. There was work to be done even in a perfect garden that God made. Not because it wasn't perfect, but because, man, we have to be busy doing something. It's not healthy not to ever do anything. So our original plan, God said, be fruitful, multiply. In other words, make this whole earth. I see it as, in other words, make this whole earth like Eden. The whole world is not Eden. But you see how Eden is? Take, subdue it. Make it, what I'll, make, it, make it the vision that I've given you, Adam. Name all the birds. Name all the animals. Do whatever. Establish this. Establish this for me. Did God need Adam to do that? No. He could have done it himself, but he chose to make man in his image to portray God. As an ambassador to represent Christ. The earth wasn't the same as Eden. Why does it say why did the Lord say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is on earth as it is in heaven? Because he's put us here for a reason, for his plans to, to happen the way he wants us to be. He issued the decree and they were supposed to make it happen. Subdue the earth, Adam. Spread my knowledge. Reproduce and spread my, my knowledge to your children, your grandchildren. Let there be a world and an earth filled with people that know about me and my goodness and who I am and what I've done. Let people know all over the earth. Take care of this land. I made this little beautiful piece of land called Eden, but I want you to make the rest of the world just like this. I've given you a pattern. I've given you an example of what to do, and I've put you here for a reason and a purpose. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. I've breathed my life into you for a reason to do something. Eden is where the idea of the kingdom of God begins. And that's where the kingdom of God, uh, not necessarily Eden, but that's where we see the kingdom of God when it's established. He is trying to establish his kingdom. Why does it say he's king of kings and lord of lords? Because when he's talking about a king of kings, he's the king of every earthly king. And when he talks about lord of lords, he is the lord of every spiritual entity that may be out there. There is only one God that is above all the gods. We sang about it. Your name name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Above all thrones, principalities, and powers, he wants to let this world know, I am God in the physical, and I am God in the spiritual realm. There's nobody else besides him. We were created to image God. We were created as God's representatives on earth. Eden's location is found uh, at the time where it was in Genesis 2, verse 8, 14, it talks about where it was in the rivers. Once the fall of man came, the Bible says that he put a flaming sword to guard it. Man was banished from the Garden of Eden. If the whole world was the Garden of Eden, then they would have been banished to Mars or something, the moon. But no, they were banished away from that Garden of Eden. They could no longer go into God's garden. They could no longer just go in freely. Something was severed. It was severed. But God made a way for us to get back. See, that devil counted on Adam and Eve dying immediately. And again, I'm trying not to get sidetracked, but I... The Lord said, if you eat this fruit, you're going to die. And the devil knew that. And the devil knows that God is not a liar. And the devil knows that God has to keep his word. But the devil doesn't know everything. Because I'm thinking he assumed that he thought as soon as they ate the apple, they were going to fall dead. But God in his grace and mercy, they are dying. They did die. But it was a gradual thing. They could have died on the spot. Our original purpose could have been ruined. The devil would have laughed and said, I won. But God said, no, they are going to die, but I'm going to make a way to redeem them. 
But God, they can't image you anymore. I'm going to make a way where they still can through my son Jesus. I'm going to ask Bethany to come. He told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Make a world full of God. Make a world full of me. Make a world full of my knowledge. They ended up getting banished from that, Eden. Then through Israel, God wanted Israel to multiply and be blessed and show this world who the God of Israel is. Show this, show this world who I am and, and the, God, the name of the God of Israel would go before them. They would know, oh, you serve the God of Israel. So it was, it was being known. We see the story of Ruth. What does Ruth said? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She heard about the God. She, she, was, she heard about it through the life of Naomi and different things. Now God is wanting to be fruitful and multiply through us, through his people, through his church. He wants us to do the same, to spread his name, his knowledge, and different things, to make disciples. Disciples of all nations teaching men the truth. As we see from creation, God, God with the different animals and birds and things, there is diversity there. That's why you are who you are. That's why your circumstance is what it is, because you've been called to be a disciple. You've been called to image Christ, to this lost and dying world. Somebody has to be the image of Christ going through cancer. What does that look like? Somebody has to be the image of Christ as a professional baseball player or football player. Somebody has to be the image of Christ as a doctor or as a lawyer. What does that look like? What does that look like? Someone has to lose a loved one and still be a Christian and show the life of Christ. What does that look like? See, God says, I, I have, I've had my, my people that are portraying my image through whatever they're facing. It rains on the just and the unjust. We can't control what happens, but we can control who we go to who we depend upon, and God is saying, I want to show this world all the different types of, I've heard that term imagers, so I'm using it, imagers that I have in this world. What does that look like? What is a Christian imager of God that works in the old field, what does that look like? What is a, a Christian imager of Christ that's a widow look like what does that look like somebody has to be an athlete and a soldier, a veteran, a prisoner as an imager of Christ someone has to be blind Fanny Crosby was born blind if you don't know who that is she wrote a bunch of the hymns that we sing Blessed Assurance, different things Not, not. I think it is Blessed Assurance yes, that's one of her main ones she was born blind, but she wrote hymns. Somebody asked her, if you, can, if you can have your vision, would you pray for it and ask for it? She said, no. She said, I want Jesus to be the first thing these eyes see. That's what a Christian imager looks like. Writing songs and hymns and stuff and praising the Lord. I'm going to invite you to stand. Bethany's dad died of leukemia. He was a worship pastor, worship leader. He wrote songs. And he left this world singing a song that they've never heard before. I believe they probably inscribed some of the, the little thing that he was singing in his tombstone. God's saying, I have my people, my imagers that I've created and they're going to glorify me. And they're going to spread my knowledge. And they're going to show this world. That's why God has us here. Because he wants us to reproduce that life that we have inside us. To show this world 
to show this world what a true image of Christ is. Will you be his imager this morning, today? In whatever, wherever you find yourself, whatever you find yourself, whatever circumstance, will you be fruitful and multiply? Will you make disciples? Will you let the world know and come to the knowledge of Christ through your life? We're here to show that God's a protector, provider, a healer. But if still he doesn't do any of those things, he's still our rock. He's still our fortress. He's still our comforter. He's still the one we depend on each and every day to make it through the day. In the good times and in the bad, he wants this world to see what an imager looks like. They're made not my image. Stephen's getting stoned to death. The father, he sees the father standing up. What does Stephen say? Forgive them. They don't know what they do. Basically what Jesus said. That's why he stood up. That's my imager right there. That's him. That's him. He's showing them. He's showing them who I am. Why did Jesus say, you see me, you see the Father? Show us the Father. What do you mean show us the Father? You see me, you see the Father. What did he say? Things that I do, you will do, and greater things also. He's not saying we're God, we become God. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, you let me live my life through you, and you will represent me on this earth the way you were meant to represent me. Be fruitful and multiply. Let Christ live through you. Before I let you come pray, sadly, they're imagers. They weren't able to do their job because they were aborted. Sadly, there are imagers that have ruined their life because of drugs or alcohol. You ought to see what uh, Seattle, and Oregon, some of these big cities look like, people look like a bunch of zombies. Sitting there, glazed eyes, bent over, walking like this, laying on the floor. That's not what God created us for. The devil's laughing the whole time. Because he sees people like that and he's like, that's not what God created you for. You're not doing a good job. But thank the Lord there's people that have come out of that. They Thank the Lord there's people that have come out of those situations. They've been restored, amen. Praise God. There's been people that have been in those situations and that's not the end because they've cried out to God. They've been messed up in those situations. I got a friend that he's a dear friend of mine from California. He used to be on acid all the time. And one day... He felt God told him, he said, if you do this one more time, you'll never come back. You'll lose your mind and you'll never come back from this. You'll never know what's going on. You won't know your surroundings. But worst of all, you'll never have an opportunity to repent and come to me. Thank God he listened. He gave his heart to the Lord and the Lord delivered him from that. But there's people out there that don't make that choice. And they stay in that state. And that's the way they end up dying. But today, God can restore us today. Maybe you hadn't done a good job, the best job. But we're still here. God says, you can do it. I'll do it through you. You've been restored. Restore other people. That's why it's so beautiful to see when the prodigal comes. It's beautiful to see the prodigals come home. To me, it is. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they smell like. It's beautiful to see them come back because I realize they're being restored to what they were originally created to do is image the image of Christ. That's what they were created to do. Amen. I better close. The Lord spoke to you in some way. Or maybe you're here, you want to stand for a loved one. I'm just going to invite you to come. Nobody comes, that's fine. We'll close as as the Lord sees fit. But if the Lord's spoken to you in any way, 
come and we'll pray for you. If you have a special request, we'll pray for you. Let's just spend time around these altars today in the presence of the Lord.